Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave with a, I, well, it's an interesting category of what is about to happen because a friend of Tessid was coming by today and they are here in the building and we were talking about what we could shoot because uh, this friend of Tessid had never been in the cave and we were thinking about what kind of shoot we could do to welcome him into the cave and then we came, I don't, can't remember who came up with this concept, but we realized what if he had something he wanted to see in the shop? We could do a reverse show and tell, where instead of me looking at something new, I'm showing something I already have to someone for whom it is new. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to welcome friend of Tested, Andrew Barth. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Good to see you, man. Great to see you, too. Uh, Andrew uh, did all of the uh, incredible heavy lifting on the Apollo Command Module hatch that we assembled at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in the summer of 2019. Uh, and you currently, can we say where you work? I'd rather not. If there that's you go. Okay, but Andrew yeah. works uh, in aerospace. Yep. There we go. Uh, and you said you wanted to see the 2001. So let's talk I about. Did, let's yeah. talk about why you wanted to see this. Uh, so 2001 was one of the coolest movies ever. Yeah. Uh, I remember seeing it with my dad. I don't know what year, but I was I was pretty young, yeah. and I remember thinking, what, what was what what just happened? You know, <laughs> uh, and like. To be clear, I think about that every single time. Yeah. But like, I get more and more of it. But either way, it's so interesting, so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and as you know, I like spacesuits and I like space in general. So I. We I really do a want lot of conversing about spacesuits yeah, and yeah. spacesuit mechanics and engineering and. Absolutely, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and so this is one of the one of the things in the movie that caught my eye the most. Um, maybe weirdly, maybe not. I don't know. But yeah, I, I just wanted to see this in person. Um, maybe talk a little bit about your process. Yeah. How this particular suit came to be, maybe a little bit about Chris Hadfield if you want. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things I love about 2001 is how much research Stanley famously put into it by bringing in NASA engineers and future prognosticators to help him assemble an idea of what the future of space travel could be. And I like there's a real a Mercury suit feel to this, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, please. Oh, yeah. Everything's meant to be handled. And, you know, he didn't worry too much about the wrist rings. They just mm -hmm. aluminum fascia over the edge of the sleeves. But this is very mercury, the, even the colors. Yeah, indeed. absolutely. Indeed. And I remember, I actually say, I remember a textbook from the 70s saying, oh, future spaces would have these kind of ribs uh, all over them. There's an old textbook. Yeah. Um, when I embarked on commissioning this, because I commissioned a guy named Mike Scott to do most of the building, I contributed the backpack and then all of the connecting parts. These actually, uh, wait, there we go. These buckles mm -hmm. are actually Martin Baker ejection seat buckles. Okay. You're aware, yeah. Yeah, these, I was, I was just looking at these as you turn it around. Those look uh, genuine. Yeah, to they something. are. Um, although I, funnily enough, I couldn't find this. Part. Okay. I just found an eBay auction with like five of these and I bought them as, as a lot so that I could replace these. I handmade this out of aluminum on both sides. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was a pain in the ass <laughs> to get it right. Um, but yeah, I like you can see. So they were building this in England in the late 60s. It's uh -huh. like, of course, they're grabbing a late 60s Martin Baker. Yeah. yeah this yeah. is like what was in the surplus shop, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Let's see, what else was I? Uh, oh, um, I will save my favorite fact about the suit for last. For sure. uh, there's something that I really loved when I got some reference material about the, the letra set here. So they were using a uh, rub down press on type. Okay. Do you, do you know about what I'm this is? I'm not familiar, is? no. Okay. Uh, when I was a kid, slip decals were for models, mm -hmm. but like when you wanted really high end, like colored text on something, even if it was like an annual report, you mm -hmm. ordered what was called dry transfer lettering. Okay. And it was uh, a kind of a soft lettering on a, on a, on a, like a vellum back and you held it up to a thing and with a pencil, you rubbed over the lettering and it transferred it from the backing to whatever you were putting it on. I see. Okay. And then you sealed it. And they would sell them in sheets of letter set with like, you know, five of every letter so you could, you know, and this is what, gra this is how graphic designers worked before there was easy color printing. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I remember assembling annual reports with this where it was thousands and thousands of dollars <laughs> worth of dry transfers to get all the colored text on. Well, on the back, and I, I have not gone to making the decals, there's really nobody who makes dry transfer anymore. 
So I want to have some slip decals made, and I found some reference, and there's this big paragraph of information that should be at the bottom of this. It's actually the legalese from the bottom <laughs> of a sheet of lecture set. Really? Yeah. Wow. You, no one in the movie would ever <laughs> see it up close, but I have a picture close enough that you can read it, and it's just like, they're like, ah, screw it, and they just like <laughs> rub from that. Yeah, was it just like, I don't know what to put on here, there's just a big block of text, why not? Exactly. Kind of thing? Yes, that's, that's totally. Fun. And there's a bunch of detailing missing from here right now because I've never gotten around to, I really need to print my reference material up one-to-one -one because there's all, it's basically like almost a subway map of colored lines and little dials and wow. dots and stuff to, to fill in here. This has never been right. Also, on the original suit, uh, there was actually a piano hinge here and this opened up so that they had access to the fans. This tube was an actual fan keeping the visor from fogging up. Uh, was there like a manifold in there to blow it up across the visor or just? I don't think so. Okay. I don't yeah. think there was. And you know, I have no idea how loud it was on set. I don't <laughs> have any idea how well it worked. I can't find any account of someone who wore this and was uncomfortable in it. Yeah. Um, it is hilarious how heavy this helmet is. Oh, there we go. And this is mounted the correct way to the original, which is two pins, two dowel pins and yeah. magnets. Wow. Uh, and this neck piece was made this way which obviously there's a great efficiency to doing it in two joined halves than one big cut aluminum piece. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not wasting a ton of aluminum. Yeah. So I had these water cut by a local shop. Oh, man. Isn't that fun? Yeah, I was, I was of course, my brain, my brain goes to uh, neck rings first on spacesuits and all the, the hardware, so I'm very appreciative of that. Wait till you, here, go ahead and just, go ahead and hold it. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's significant. And is I, it fiberglass or something? It's fiberglass. The, as far as I can tell, the neck rings are solid aluminum in the real <laughs> thing. I've never held a real helmet, but mm -hmm. they look like that. I can't imagine that they're much lighter than that. They're thick, too. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot real. of aluminum. The other, one of the more difficult engineering parts is the fact that this glass bows out just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. the guy who built this had to build a manifold to hold the visor in an airtight way and heat it while putting in a little pressure to get it to bow out. <laughs> yeah, if it were just a single curve, it'd be fine, but compound is harder. Yeah. Wow. Um, so there's, there's a feature to this that's completely hidden. Put it on your head. All right. And if you breathe, just in and out steadily. I'm sure that they recorded Dave Bowman's breathing sound in the movie inside that helmet. It sounds... It sounds exactly right. Yeah. Right? It's like such a sense memory from the film. That is the coolest the thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, I was like, what am I missing? And then you said the breathing. I was like, you're right. <laughs> it's exactly yeah, this it's, sound. And it's yeah. so much like Kubrick to do that, right? Yeah. I love oh, that's that so part. cool. <laughs> so when you said you wanted to see this helmet, I will admit to you that yeah. about six months ago, I pulled the liner, which was all um, like a half-inch urethane. Okay. Oh, sorry, half-inch neoprene, self-stick neoprene. I saw a reference that it was sewn leather in the interior, so I started down the path of making a leather interior for this, and my sewing machine crapped the bed. I know. And I went and bought a new Sailrite sewing machine, but I never got around to finishing the thing that had caused me to buy the new machine. Uh -huh. And so I did this yesterday. I, <laughs> I finished this piece and put it in, and it's not perfect, um, but it it's, beautiful, it's definitely more legit than the, than the neoprene. Uh, and I like the, I love how dead it sounds in there. Yeah. You know, like when you hear, oh yeah, I guess you, Oh, you, you, you heard from his microphone. Okay, yeah. good. Um, oh, that's, yeah. Um, these, this is actually correct, like all of the breakdown of these little parts, and they're ah. just like stuck on there. Yeah. <laughs> is that accurate to the originals as well? I, I'm not sure if they were Velcroed, or I think they might have been. Um, it's hard to say. These things got, got seriously abused after 2001. They show up in... They show up in uh, Doctor Who episodes. They show up in a bunch of British sci-fi movies in the background of stuff, repainted. There's one suit uh, that you can actually, if you pull the, pull it and stretch it, you can see that it was painted. Uh, it was silver at first, and then it was red, and then it was yellow. So they were recycling suits throughout the film uh -huh. in order to like get to the get colors the... that they want. Yeah. It, one thing about displaying spacesuits that I was really surprised by is that they're all stupid heavy. Yeah, yeah. Even the, 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 the film ones, 
are still, there's a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Um, and they really, they harm the mannequins. I think this guy was about six inches taller <laughs> no. when he started. And that he's, uh, yeah. Um, uh, this is a piece that isn't actually, this is a funny one because it's not visible on all the suits. And it is visible in a lot of the early prototype suits, but it's not on camera a bunch. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love it. I just I love the IBM and I love these 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 simple buttons, which are basically just held down with them, um, double stick. Okay. Palm. Yeah, I saw yeah. it give a little bit, but not, not yeah. that much. Yeah, and that's that feels like nice and accurate, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Like a uh, a membrane type push button type. Exactly. Thing. Yeah. Exactly. I do find myself looking at the set with like all the people wearing these, wondering were they all just sweating balls in there? Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, even with the airflow, I imagine it's just awful. I, you know? I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. I mean, Chris Hadfield and I were both sweating bullets immediately. And you had cooling suits on. We had cooling partially, suits Partially, at least. My favorite part of wearing the cooling suit, first, when I put it on, I turned it on, and I watched my body heat melt five <laughs> pounds of ice in, like, ten minutes. Yeah. And I said that to Chris, and Chris was like, well, we never run them full time. We never run the cool suit full time. You run it until it brings you down and then you, you stop, you cycle it. Okay. Um, so we did that and our cool suits lasted for about the full hour of our, of our Comic-Con walk. Um, it, a couple of things that were really lovely. That was, we gave, I gave Chris Hatfield a first. He had never worn a fake spacesuit. <laughs> when he, when he, and you know, I, have you put on a spacesuit? Uh, I actually got to put on a uh, film one. I will tell you about it later. Excellent. Yeah. So yeah. you know that the indignity of that yeah, final the, the ass uh, goes out and you have to get this whole thing going. And it never really quite sits until you're, you know. Yeah. yeah. And so I went through that with Chris and <laughs> it turns out there is no dignified way to do it. It looks just like you'd expect. But then as we were getting out and Chris got out, he left the arms halfway undone and the legs halfway undone and that's how they leave the suits so that they can properly have oh. the most surface area to dry out. Yeah. I was like, oh, it's a real NASA <laughs> way to leave the suits. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> to get rid of it. There's a little detail that he probably did subconsciously. Just uh, No, he said specifically. Oh, he's okay. like, oh, I'm going to show you how I do that. <laughs> Chris show you how it's really done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's buttoned down. <laughs> for this one, did you have any lighting installed? To Not obviously for the walk, but for later for showing your face? No. Uh, and that's because there weren't any lights in the helmets. Okay. In the film. That was another thing I was going to ask, yeah. It's a very rare one. I mean, because every film puts lighting in the helmet. Yeah. And it's a ridiculous idea from an actual usability standpoint. Yeah, blinded by yeah, something when totally. you're looking at space. It's maybe not the best, but it, yeah. It reminds me of watching Thelma and Louise when they're in the car at night and there's like clearly this giant <laughs> bar of light under the dashboard lighting their faces. Uh -huh. It's the same exact thing. They can't see out of that car at all. Yeah. Um, so no, there were, that's actually one of the weirdly like quietest high fidelity things Kubrick did about this suit is that there are no lights on any of the NASA suits ever yeah like I don't even think there's a blinky I think there is a display on the EMUs that you can like, like a seven segment or something uh-huh yeah exactly but that's it there's like not a blinky light on the whole thing the only other uh, example I can think of is the finger light from the like the Mercury Gemini that cut but off yeah. the circulation <laughs> to John Glenn's hand because, I didn't know that <laughs> yeah because when they did the first this is funny. When I did it first, I mm -hmm. sewed on a little loop, just like the real thing, and then mm -hmm. I took that same lensed bulb and shoved it in there, and it was like hurting my finger. And then I found an account of John Glenn as like his notes after the first time he took it up was like it cut the circulation off to my finger. That's not great, yeah. But th there's also like this this aspect of like even in the imitation of these, we end up crossing over into zones of engineering and experience that were gone through by the real engineers and the real astronauts. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. I, I find that, that uh, it's like a form of archaeology. And it's actually not even that different from what Chris does over at ClickSpring, mm -hmm. right? Trying to figure out how you could have built an antikythera mechanism using all original tools. Yeah. And he's unearthing psychology of the maker by doing this in a way I feel like, it's like has real veracity and real rigor to it. Absolutely, yeah. I get the same thing when I do this. Yeah, as we were talking about earlier with Apollo and whatnot, um, digging through the uh, the engineers' brains, kind of through their yeah. work, yeah. I can imagine absolutely the, the the same thing here. 
Well, you had the same experience I did, which is learn, realizing once you start to quantify NASA hardware that all of the engineers are using whole numbers as much as possible. So uh -huh. it's not like 7.359, it would be mm -hmm. 7.1875, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. something, something sta static. Yeah, yeah. And I really appreciate that because it makes replicating them easier too. Yeah. Uh, but that's another yeah. way it feels like a craftsman, a craftsperson is reaching out to you across time. Absolutely, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, what is the next space piece of hardware you're obsessed with that or you're working on? Um, so actually it's an Aces helmet. Oh, uh, yes, that, right. That would be the next one. Um, I am kind of in the process of doing some, some disconnects here and there for, mm -hmm. for Apollo. Um, but we'll see how that goes. I've kind of stalled on that just because of time. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have a job, you have a real job. I do, <laughs> it turns out, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll probably be making some of those uh, gas disconnects uh, pretty soon here, or not. <laughs> I said that back in January and- Yeah, know. I know, some of these things but, take years and years and years. Yeah, um, I'm, just, I'm just glad I get to see things like this uh, and learn from it so that maybe uh, in my own projects it will help, and it certainly has in the past. Anything you want in terms of information, you let me know. I love exulting about spacesuits with you, man. <laughs> thank you. It is an endlessly fun subject. Thanks so much for coming by. Thank you. And thank you for our first uh, reverse <laughs> show and tell. <laughs> um, not the last. We'll be doing this again. Um, people come here. We can break out some things that they want to see. Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm Adam Savage, and I'll see you next time.